Another way to produce new topological spaces from old topological spaces is to use products. The set theoretic definition of a product of a family of sets works like this. If we start with a collection of sets indexed by some indexing set A, then the product is defined to be the set of maps, little x, from the indexing set A to the union of the x alphas, such that the image x alpha of some little alpha in A actually lies in the set x alpha. This is the set theoretic formulation of the intuition that we have about how products work, which is that an element of the product is a tuple. x alpha, indexed over the a's, in which each of these x alphas lands in capital X alpha. The structure of the product is completely controlled by a collection of maps. We have one of these maps for each beta in A, and the map carries an element of the product, that is to say one of these tuples X alpha, to the betaeth component of that tuple. This is called the betaeth projection map. This map completely determines the structure of this product. This product is kind of defined so that this map can exist and have good properties. So we're going to use these projection maps to the, define a topology on this product in the circumstance that each of these x alphas is given a topology. Let's do that now. So suppose that we have our family, but now our family is a family of topological spaces. Each one of these x alphas has a topology on it. And we're going to take our product set, and we're going to equip it with a topology. That topology is going to be the initial topology with respect to the projection maps P, R, beta. That means that we're looking at the coarsest topology on the product such that all of these maps P, R, beta are continuous. When we defined the initial topology, remember that we had a way to construct it using a subbase. That subbase is taken by taking the inverse images under all of our maps of all of our open subsets. So what are all the inverse images of the open subsets of x beta under the projection maps? Well, they're exactly the product of all of the x alphas except for alpha equal to beta, and then u is replacing what you get in the beta component. This is a subset of the product of all of the x alphas, and if you take all of these for all the different open subsets of all the different x betas, then you get a subbase for the topology. This topology on the product is conveniently called the product topology. Because we have a subbase for the topology, we can also write down a base for the topology. Remember that if we have a subbase for the topology, a base can be constructed by taking the finite intersections of the subbasic opens. That means that I can look at the collection of those subsets of the product, where I take a finite subset, B of A, and I look at the product of some U betas, where each U beta is open inside X beta, and then for all of the other alphas, the alphas that don't lie in B, I'll just take X alpha. And I'll take these collections, put them together, and they'll form a base for the product topology. That is to say, inside the product topology, every open set is a union of things that look like this. We have a finite collection of some open subsets of the X betas. And then once we're done with that finite collection, we have the product of the remaining X alphas. This condition, this finiteness, means that the behavior of the product is quite familiar for finite products and a little bit surprising for infinite products. We're going to see that right now. Let's begin with a finite story. If A is some finite set, we might as well assume that A is the set of positive natural numbers less than or equal to n. Then when we write down this product, we often write it as x1 cross x2 cross dot 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 cross xn. And this is now the topology generated by the products u1 through un 
where each of these UIs is open inside X. So this is maybe precisely what you expected the product topology to be. It's just controlled by taking the opens in each of the factors, and you product those opens together, and you get an open inside the product. And for finite products, that's exactly how it works. So in particular, when we look at the standard Euclidean topology on Rn, that turns out to coincide with the product topology, where you regard Rn as R cross R cross R cross R cross R. How do we prove that? Well, we're going to prove it by comparing bases on each side. On the one hand, if you think of the standard topology, it has a base consisting of the balls. These are the balls of radius epsilon centered at x. The product topology, on the other hand, has a base consisting of cubes. These are the products of the open intervals centered at xi of radius epsilon. So here I get a cube centered at x of quote-unquote radius epsilon. And now the key point here is that each one of these sets is contained in the other kind of set. In other words, for every x in Rn, if I take an epsilon greater than zero, I can find a delta also greater than zero such that the ball of radius delta is contained in the cube of radius epsilon. In the other direction, if I take an epsilon greater than zero, I can find a delta greater than zero such that the cube of radius delta is contained in the ball of radius epsilon. In other words, if I draw this picture in R2, I can take a square that looks like this centered at my x, and I can always find a disk centered at the same x that's completely contained in that square. But at the same time, I can find a square, again still centered at that x, that's completely contained in that circle. Now since any open set in the product topology is a union of these cubes, it can also be expressed as a union of these balls. At the same time, since any open set of the standard topology can be written as a union of these balls, it can also be written as a union of these cubes. Therefore, the two topologies are exactly the same. So, so far we haven't seen any big surprises with the product topology. Things seem to be going quite nicely. And indeed, they're going to continue to go nicely when we contemplate subspaces of Euclidean space. We can look at a collection of subspaces of various Euclidean spaces, and we can look at the product topology, or we can look at the subspace topology, and once again these things coincide. Still the situation is quite nice, but now things are going to get a little weird. When you contemplate infinite products, the restriction that we wrote down, the fact that we were looking at a base where we only have finitely many interesting opens and then the rest have to be the full set, tells us that the product topology for an infinite set is going to be a little bit strange. So let's do the following. Let's consider r omega, which is just going to be the countable product of r with itself. So I have one copy of r for every positive natural number, and I'm going to product all those together. Now what's strange is that if I do the same thing with the open interval, and I product all those together, that's a subset of r omega, but it is very much not open. This, if you like, is the set of sequences of real numbers. And this is the set of sequences of real numbers such that all those real numbers stay within 0 and 1. And that subset is just not an open subset of r to the omega. Why not? Well, it goes back to this subbase that we wrote down for our topology. If u is an open inside r omega, and if x is a point of u, then u has to contain some basic open, which looks like this. It's the product of some epsilon neighborhoods around each xi, but for only finitely many of my indices. 
past that finite number, I have just copies of r. What does that mean? That means that this open subset u has to contain every point of the form x1 through xn, stopping at some finite stage, and then carrying on with any real numbers that you like. Any sequence of real numbers can follow this initial sequence, which has to coincide with my original x. So this point here, no matter what it looks like, no matter what these yi's are, this point lies in u. This is rather surprising because it's telling us that the product of a collection of open sets inside some topological spaces need not be open in the product of those topological spaces. Here's another example that shows the same kind of strange behavior. If we choose a finite set S and we equip it with a discrete topology, then once again we can take the product of S with itself. First we can do it finitely many times, and that will still be discrete. However, if we choose to do it infinitely many times, it is no longer discrete. In fact, not only is this not discrete, but as long as S has cardinality at least two, S to the omega is homeomorphic to our old friend the Cantor space. If you think about it, this is surprising in at least two ways. First of all, I'm telling you that this very concrete space, which is a subspace of the real line, is homeomorphic to this infinite product of discrete spaces, which is quite an abstract procedure. But then in addition, I'm telling you something else that's surprising, which is that this doesn't depend on the cardinality of S so long as the cardinality is at least two. I'm telling you that if I take zero, one to the omega, then that's the same thing as zero, one, two, three, four, five to the omega. Okay, so what's going on? Why do we choose the product to be this way? This seems strange to me. Why would I ever select for the product to operate this way? Well, the reason comes down to the universal property of the product. Namely, if we're gonna have a topological space Y and a family of topological spaces X alpha, then I'm gonna write down a family of continuous maps F alpha from Y to X alpha, one for each alpha in A. So I'm gonna write down a whole pile of continuous maps and I'm gonna stack them up. Then I could put those maps together into a single map it's a unique continuous map, which I'll just call f from y to the product of these x alphas. And it's unique with the property that for every beta, if I take my map and I compose it with the projection map onto the beta factor, then I'll recover my f beta. In other words, this map here has the property that its beta component is exactly f beta. And I've exactly rigged the definition to ensure that if all of these maps are continuous, then this map is continuous. And that's an if and only if statement. This map will be continuous if and only if each of these maps is continuous. So this is a way of breaking down the problem of giving a map, continuous map into a product, into a whole lot of small problems, namely of giving continuous maps into each of the factors of this product. Let's watch that in action. So I mentioned that the Cantor space is homeomorphic to the infinite product of zero, one with the discrete topology. So let's write down a continuous map from the Cantor space to that product. This map that we're gonna write down will turn out to be a homeomorphism, but for now I just wanna write down the map and see that it's continuous. Well, what do I have to do to write down a continuous map from C to this product? My universal property says that what I have to do is I have to write down for every positive natural number a map from C to 0, 1 with the discrete topology itself. This is the nth factor in this infinite product. So now instead of writing down a single continuous map to something that's a little mysterious, I'm going to write down an infinite family of continuous maps to something that's very familiar. I've traded off the task of writing down a continuous map into something I don't know that much about with the task of writing down a continuous map to something that I do understand, but now I have to do it infinitely many times. Okay, so how do I write down a continuous map from C into a discrete topological space? 
Well, I have to tell you what points go to zero and what points go to one. But of course, if I tell you what points go to zero, then all of the other points have to be the ones that go to one. That is to say, the inverse image of one has to be the complement of the inverse image of zero. So I really just have to give you the inverse image of zero. And this is discrete, so what property does it have to have? Well, it has to be both closed and open because that's how zero is. So I simply need to write down the inverse image of zero inside the Cantor space, which needs to be clopen. How will I do that? Well, I'm gonna try and exploit the fact that I know a base of clopen subsets of the Cantor space. Here's how I might do that. I can write down Sn as the union of those closed intervals of the form 3k over 3 to the n to 3k plus 1 over 3 to the n that are contained in the intersection of the first n of my approximations to the Cantor space. This is like the nth approximation to the Cantor space. And in that nth approximation, I'm going to look at all of those intervals that actually lie inside there. So for example, in this approximation to the Cantor space, this, this union looks like the union of this with this with this and with this. So in general, this is going to be the union of two to the n different intervals sitting inside the interval from zero to one. Okay, so these things are certainly clopen inside this intersection. And so when I intersect them with C itself, it'll be clopen again. So that means that Sn intersect C is clopen, and I'll simply choose phi n inverse of zero to be that clopen set. Okay, so what happens here? I'm taking the inverse image of zero under phi n to be this. That defines for me a continuous map from C to 0, 1 with the discrete topology. I have one of those for every positive natural number n, so I put those together into a map phi, which goes from the Cantor space to the infinite product of 0, 1 with itself. That map phi turns out to be a homeomorphism.